Out on the front row, I just was praying, and so I'll pray now again that, God, that as, as we look into your word, as I preach your word this morning, that, that God, something would happen in this room that's, that people that have been in church for a really long time, that have lost the part of them that stands amazed in the presence of Jesus. That wonder how that you could love us, a sinner, condemned, unclean, and that you would put back in our hearts the song, how marvelous, how wonderful. And our song will ever be, how marvelous, how wonderful is our Savior's love for me. Holy Spirit, would you do that now? Would you exalt Jesus not only through this message, but in our hearts and in our lives? Holy Spirit, move up and down these aisles and change hearts. Wake us up. Ignite a flame in us for your name, for your glory. Holy Spirit, would you do that now? In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. It's good leadership, excellent leadership. I would invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, if you brought a Bible with you today, Luke chapter... 23, verse 39, that's where we'll start here in just a minute. We're continuing our series that we called and are calling the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. That's Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> seven sayings of Jesus on the cross were throughout the six hours that Jesus hung on the cross, he made seven statements. He made seven statements and and it's important to remember that every single one of the seven statements that Jesus made while he hung on the cross has significance. Every one of those seven things that he says on the cross has a meaning, it has a purpose. And I think Hallem made an excellent point last week. He talked about when somebody is dying and they're saying their last words, you listen. You listen to what they're having to say and <clears throat> we're looking over the next few weeks at the last words of Jesus as he is dying. Now obviously Jesus is gonna rise from the grave and he's gonna have other things that he says, but think about, think about the significance of this moment right here that we're looking at in the scriptures. That, that God, the immortal God, 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 God in the flesh that came to this earth is dying. The immortal God is dying. And he's speaking, he has things that he's saying, and so we as a church are gonna to listen to what it is that he has to say. Last week we looked at the first thing that Jesus said and where he looks down at the very people that were crucifying him and they just crucified him and he, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing, right? And we learned from that that even in the middle of Jesus being unjustly murdered, even though the people that crucified him did not deserve it, Jesus poured out forgiveness to them. He prayed for their forgiveness. And we learn through that that you and I are able to forgive. You and I are able to forgive others even though other people may not deserve it because that is how Jesus forgave us. And now today, we come to the second thing that Jesus says when he's on the cross. He's just offered this forgiveness to these guys, these people that crucified him. And the second thing, hear this, the second thing we're gonna see Jesus do is offer forgiveness to this common criminal that's being crucified next to him. <clears throat> and church, also I noticed something as I studied the cross in preparation for this Sunday, something I've never really thought about before or seen before, and that is two of the seven statements, two of the seven that Jesus speaks on the cross deal specifically with the subject of forgiveness I believe that's 28%, if I did my calculations right. 28% of the things that he says while he's on the cross deal specifically with the issue of forgiveness. I'll think about that for just a second. 
There are literally hundreds of things that Jesus taught when he was here on this planet. Hundreds of principles that he talked about, that he lived out, that he embodied. And there's a hundred things that he could have reiterated while he was on the cross, while he was hanging there. He could have, he could have said, hey, y'all need to remember, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust can destroy. Don't do that. He could have said, hey, remember the pursuit of righteousness is the most important thing in your life. But he didn't, right? He could have said, hey, y'all are murdering me right now. <laughs> remember what I said about murder. You shouldn't murder people. You shouldn't even think about murdering people, but we've moved past that. Y'all are actually murdering me, and that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. But he didn't. Um, hundreds of things that Jesus could have talked about, reiterated with his dying words, and yet two of the seven things he says dealt specifically with the issue of forgiveness. Now, why? Why would he do that? And here's the reason, because I think God knew how deeply you and I would struggle with the concept of forgiveness. I think he, he knew that about us, how deeply you and I would wrestle with the concept and the issue of forgiveness. One of the things that was so eye-opening to me about Ronnie Smith's death and kind of what happened after Ronnie died was, <clears throat> and where Ronnie was murdered in Libya was the response of people on the internet, not only to his death, but specifically uh, Anita's letter of forgiveness that she wrote to Ronnie's murderers. And if you didn't know this, Anita wrote a letter to the, Ronnie's killers and she forgave them. And, uh, and I made the mistake of looking kind of on the internet of the responses that people had. It just upset me for a long time. If you want to get upset today, you can go read them yourself. But for lack of better words, I was dumbfounded at the response that she received. I guess I had in the back of my mind that the people would be profoundly moved by this woman who offered forgiveness to these people who hadn't asked for it and most definitely didn't deserve it. And, and many people were moved by it. Um, uh, Anderson Cooper from CNN did the interview, blew him away, <coughs> this idea that, he, that she would forgive these people. But what was shocking to me, and honestly, I guess it shouldn't shock me that people that write comments on articles on the internet would say that because most people that write comments on articles on the internet are bitter, bitter and cynical people for the most part but what was shocking to me is that most people were just appalled they were appalled that Anita would just offer forgiveness so quickly and so easily these people that murdered her husband this idea that she would do that did not register to them it just it, it just blew their minds about how or why you would just forgive somebody that murdered your husband. And I, and I thought, why is that? And then it hit me that forgiveness is a foreign concept to a sinful heart. Just the idea of forgiving somebody who has wronged you is a foreign and it's an alien concept to a sinful, fallen heart. And God knew that. He knew, church, he knows, he knew, he knows how difficult it is for you and for me to forgive somebody who's wronged us. He knows that. He knew that. Also, he knows this. He knew how difficult it would be for many of us in the room, I'm included, to believe that he could forgive us when we've wronged him. And that's why Jesus, I believe with all my heart, that's why Jesus in the last moments of his life are showing us picture after picture of not only what it looks like to give forgiveness to these people, that don't deserve it, but how in that exact same moment he's offering forgiveness to this guy who's hanging on the cross, who cries out to him, and through that we see a picture that God is willing to offer that same forgiveness to you and to me. And so here's where we're at in the story. Um, after forgiving these people that just crucified him, we're gonna see Jesus have this interaction with these two criminals. One's gonna be on his left, and one is gonna be on his right. <clears throat> this criminal on the left, as he encounters Jesus, as he hangs there and encounters Jesus to his dying breath, this guy on the left is gonna hurl abuse at, he's gonna scoff at, and he's gonna reject the only hope he has in the entire world. We're gonna see him do that to his dying breath. 
This other criminal, the guy that was hanging on Jesus' right, he's also going to encounter Jesus on the cross that day. Yet with his dying breath, he's going to confess his sin. He's going to cry out for mercy to Jesus. And then Jesus, we're going to see Jesus forgive him and offer him the gift of eternal life right there on the spot. And so that's the two encounters we're going to see with Jesus. Let's look at the criminal on the left and how he responds to Jesus. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged there were hurling abuse at him, (coughs) saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And so you have this one guy over here to Jesus' left, and just like Jesus, just like the other criminal to Jesus' right, he has nails in his wrist. You can envision this. He's got nails in his wrist. He's got nails in his feet. He's bleeding. He's dying. And he looks over at Jesus, and the Scripture says that he hurls abuse at Jesus. That's a strong verb in the Greek. It's the Greek verb blasphemeo. It means to throw hatred or to produce forth hatred. It's like, the, uh, like spewing venom at Jesus. That's what this guy was doing. Some of your translations in the ESV say that he railed against Jesus. And so you've got this guy. <clears throat> He's got just a few hours, maybe a few moments even to live. And the only thing he can do is hurl abuse at Jesus. Okay, now, uh, look at what he says next. In verse 39, he says, and one of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, and he says, are you not the Christ? So this guy looks at Jesus, and he says, are you not the Christ? Now, it's important to understand, church, that this was not a statement of faith by the criminal on the left. This was not uh, this criminal on the left trusting in Jesus as the Messiah or as the Christ. In the the Greek, it's this tone of, he's saying it with biting sarcasm in in an abusive, demeaning way, saying, I thought you were the Christ. I thought you were the Christ. And then I watch what he says next, and this is fascinating to me. He says, one of the criminals who was hanging there, hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? He said, save yourself and us. It hit me this week that this guy who's hurling abuse at Jesus actually cries out for Jesus to save him. He asks Jesus to save him. And now listen carefully. Both of these guys hanging on the cross with Jesus that day, both of them are going to cry out for Jesus to save them. But what we're going to see is that the condition of their hearts as they cry out to save him are radically different. When this guy cries out for Jesus to save him, there's no brokenness in his heart. There's no guilt over his sin. There's no penitence in his heart. There's no humility. He just looks at Jesus as somebody that he can manipulate to help get him off the cross. And that's why he cries out and says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now, let me ask you a question. How did Jesus respond to this guy over here? Do you remember? What did Jesus say to this guy over here? Nothing. He said absolutely nothing. Jesus doesn't even respond to the guy at all, doesn't even acknowledge him. And this guy, honestly, he's always, he's always amazed me, this guy over here to the left. I mean, if you think about it, he's dying. He is without hope. He has no chance whatsoever. And if you think about it, this guy won the lottery. He is being crucified next to the guy that created the wood that he's being crucified on. And all he can do in that moment is hurl abuse. He's being crucified next to the guy that, that the scripture tells us <coughs> this criminal understood was claiming to be the Messiah. Right? And if there's anybody in the world that ought to be open to the gospel in that moment, it ought to be this guy, right? It's over for him. If there's anybody that ought to be open to the truth of the gospel, it ought to be him. And yet all he can do is hurl abuse. You could use words like shocking 
until you read the Bible. And when you read the Bible, you realize that the scripture says that there are gonna be people that do respond to Jesus that way no matter what. And you see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18. Don't turn there. I just want you to listen to this verse because it gives us some insight into why in the world this guy without hope would not cry out for mercy in this moment to the guy he knew, Jesus, that he, he believed was claiming at least to be the Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul tells us, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And what the Bible just taught us here, church, is that there are two kinds of people in this room. You are one of the two, and there are only two. Number one, the scripture says, there are folks, there are people, the Bible says, are perishing. They're in the process of perishing. And what the, what the Bible just told us is that the message of the cross, for those of us who are perishing, the message of the cross will be to them foolishness. That word foolishness right there in the Greek is the Greek word moronos. It's where we get our English word moronic. There are going to be people, the Bible says, that hear the message of the gospel, the message of the cross, that God came in the flesh, he dwelt among us, he lived a perfect life, and they died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin so that the wrath of God would be poured on him and not on us, that we could be reconciled back to God. The people are going to hear that message of the cross and they are going to think it's the stupidest thing they've ever heard. And so it shouldn't shock us when we see a guy without hope, with his dying breaths, hurl abuse at Jesus. The scripture says that's going to happen. It shouldn't shock us when we see a woman who offers because of the unmerited forgiveness she's received through Jesus, offer the same forgiveness, unmerited, to the people that killed her husband. It shouldn't shock us when people think that's ridiculous. Because the gospel, or rather the word of God, says that's going to happen. But, the scripture says, there's another kind of person. And this is a person who is being saved. They're being saved. And what the scripture says is these people that are being saved, when they encounter the message of the cross, and the Bible is very clear about what it says here, <clears throat> when they encounter the message of the cross, for those of us who are being saved, it is, the message of the gospel is the power of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that the people, those of us who are being saved, when we encounter this message of the cross, it begins, the, the, the power of God begins to work in our lives. And when we hear the message of the cross, we're like, that, that's not stupid. That's the best thing I've ever heard in my life. And we believe into the message of the cross. We trust in the message of the cross. And we throw our lives and our eternities upon the message of the cross. And I know this is true. I know this verse is true. I've seen it with my own eyes. There are people over the years, over my life, and as a pastor, as a Christian, that I will share the gospel with intelligent people. I'll share the gospel with them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's just dumb to them. And the people that I've, 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 I've witnessed to, intelligent, not intelligent, rich, poor, old, young, male, female, and you share this truth of the gospel with them and just like, yes, they say, yes. Absolutely, it's the best thing I've ever heard. I want to trust in him right now. I've seen it in my own life. I'm telling you guys, I've seen this in my own heart every single time. I hear the message of the gospel. It, there's something inside of me that screams out, that is the truth. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a worship service and some, somebody preaches the gospel of Jesus and I walk out the door saying, man, if I wasn't saved, I would have just got saved. It's the truth, and I want you to know something. I've tried over the course of my life to run away from Jesus. I've tried, a couple times I've tried real hard. He will not let me go. I can't get away from him. You know what my, my favorite verse in the Bible is? It's uh, Psalm 71, 17. It has nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just gonna tell it, tell it to you. It says, oh God, you have taught me from my youth and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. 
your power to all who are to come. That's my favorite verse. But you know what my second favorite verse is? It's the one where Jesus is saying to the crowd of people, the thousands of people that are following him because he's feeding them and he's healing them. And he says, hey, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And it says, scripture says, everybody took off. Everybody, except the 12 who were standing there with their mouths open. And Jesus, you just ran off 3,000 people. And Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, you boys want to leave me too? You remember what Peter said? Peter said, where am I going to go? For you alone have the words of life. I love that verse because it's how I feel. Jesus, where am I going to go? Because you alone have the words of life. You could give me a trillion dollars to stop believing in Jesus. And I couldn't do it. Because gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power, not of us to hold on to it. It is the power of God to bring it to life in our hearts. It is the power of God to endure us until the end for those of us who are being saved. And that's what you see. That's what you see happening right here to this criminal. Luke chapter 23, verse 40, watch this. The guy on Jesus' right. But the other answered, the other answered, and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? Do you not even fear God since you are under the same <coughs> sentence of condemnation? For we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. This criminal to the right of Jesus, same position as the first criminal. He's broken, he's bloody, he's dying, he's got a few hours, maybe a few minutes to live. But this guy, when he encounters Jesus, his reaction is radically different. Look at verse 40. There's a few things he says, offer insight into the condition of his heart. What does he say? He rebukes the criminal. He says, do you not even fear God? Do you not fear God? And what do we learn about the, the condition of this guy's heart when he says this? What we learn is there was fear of God in his heart. People who are being saved have a fear, a godly, righteous awe and fear of the Lord in their hearts. It's one of the evidences that you're being saved. I love what John Piper said about that statement right there when he preached on this. He said that, he said, the criminal on the right is pointing out that the criminal on the left is like an ant standing at the base of Mount Everest, demanding that Mount Everest flatten itself so that he can walk across it. That's what people that are perishing do. They have no fear of the Lord in their hearts. They, they're like ants screaming at Mount Everest to move. And this criminal on the right looks at the criminal on the left and says, man, shut up. Do you not even fear God? And he goes on, look at verse 41. He says this, and this is key. He says, and we are suffering justly. He says, we are, we are you and me, buddy, we're, we're suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. Do you see, what, do you see what, God is, what the power of God's doing in this guy's heart in that moment? Do you see that? He says, we're here because we deserve to be here. What is he saying, church, while he hung on the cross? He's saying, I am a sinner. That's what, that's what people who are being saved do. They have a fear of God in their heart, and the result is, I'm a sinner. I deserve what I'm getting right here. It's a mark of a person being saved. Now, look at what he says next. He says, for we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man, but this man has done nothing wrong. What did he just say? He said, I am a sinner. I deserve to be here, but Jesus does not deserve to be here. He says, I am a sinner, but Jesus is not a sinner. A person that's being saved not only fears God, they know that they deserve the punishment they receive are going to receive for their sin, but they realize that Jesus is righteous. 
And then what he says in verse 42, the last thing the criminal says, <coughs> as he was saying, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And unlike the first criminal that Jesus completely ignores, as this guy right here does what people who are being saved do, they realize they're sinners. They realize the righteousness of Jesus and they cry out for the mercy of God to save them. Jesus lifts up his head and says one of only seven things that Jesus will say in his entire time on the cross in Luke 23, verse 43. He says, and he said to him, truly I say to you, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Confesses that Jesus is God, confesses that he's a sinner, confesses that Jesus is not, cries out for Jesus to save him, cries out for Jesus to have mercy on him, and Jesus does, and Jesus saves him. Now you remember at the beginning of this message how I said that the reason that God spends two of the seven sayings on the cross dealing with the issue of forgiveness, one, was because God knew how hard it would be for us to forgive others that didn't deserve it. And two, God knew how hard it would be for you and I to believe that God can forgive us. And I speak from experience, because this is me. There's a lot of us in this room right now that have the hardest time, especially the older we get and the more we realize how messed up we are, that we have the hardest time believing that God can just wipe somebody's slate clean that doesn't deserve it. There are some of you in the room right now and, and you're not a Christ follower. And the reason that you're not a Christ follower is not because you don't believe in God, it's because you just don't believe that God could forgive somebody like you. And that's the barrier from coming to the Lord and offering your life to him and surrendering him and trusting in this, this cross, this message of the gospel. There are probably more of you in the room that are believers, you're Christians, you're Christ followers, but right now you're so mired in sin that you can't get out of, that you think God might be done with you. You think God might be ready to give up on you. Regardless of where you are, I want you to hear this right here, listen. If you don't hear anything I say, hear this right here. If there's any story in the Bible that shows us that our salvation is by grace, through faith. It is not of your works. It is a gift of God. It's this one. If there's any place in the Bible that shows us that you're saved by grace, through faith. It's not of what you've done or haven't done. It's a gift of God. It's this one. This guy has done absolutely nothing to deserve heaven. Nothing. This guy's done nothing to deserve heaven. He's not going to be able to get off the cross and spend 50 years serving the Lord. He's not going to be able to do anything. He's not going to be able to hop off the cross and go be obedient to Jesus for 30 years. He's done absolutely nothing to earn his salvation. All in the world he did is cry out in faith, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You're not. You're God. Please save me. And Jesus says today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's it. And before I end the message today, and end with application, I want to take just a minute. We're almost done here. It's a quick message today. I, I, I want to do something. I want to just take a couple of seconds. I want to look at what Jesus actually says because it's cool. We learn a lot about heaven through what Jesus actually says there. The first thing Jesus says is, truly I say to you. So in other words, hey, listen, because what I'm about to say is going to happen. He said the word today. Today. Some pretty sweet theology we can learn from that word today. A couple things we learn about the word today is that there will be no purgatory. Not gonna be purgatory, not, you're not gonna hang out between death and life. There's no soul sleep, you're not gonna die, go to sleep and kinda just hang out for a while until Jesus decides what to do with you. Jesus said today, today. He said, and that's why Paul, that's why Paul said, when I'm absent with the body, I am going to be present with 
the Lord. That's good news, amen? There's going to come a day when you're, you're going to quit breathing and your heart is going to stop beating. And on that day, in that moment, you're going to be with Jesus, which is exactly what he says next. He says, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, everybody look at that statement. You will be with me in paradise. Now, I want to ask you a question. As you read that statement, you will be with me in paradise, what excites you more about that statement? Just be honest. What excites you more about that statement? The word paradise? Or the words, you will be with me in paradise? I did a, a series on heaven and hell a few years back, and we talked about the new heaven and the new earth, and, and, and I studied it for months. I kind of got my mind around it as much as I think humans can, as much as God reveals, and I'm telling you, a lot of people don't know this. We're not going to be floating around in the clouds singing songs forever. God recreates the earth, and that's where we spend eternity. And it's, and it's earth, but it has no sin. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be unbelievable. Think about that. No sin. No 100-degree weather. <laughs> no, no, no fights with your wife. I mean, it's just going to be unbelievable. The food. I mean, I, could, I talked for three weeks about it a couple of years ago. It's going to be unbelievable, but I'm telling you, the joy of heaven is not going to be all that stuff. The joy of heaven is going to be Jesus. That's why Paul says that our relationship, our relationship with Jesus is central to this thing we call Christianity. So Paul says, I count all things to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And church, I'm telling you, you know what the greatest joy of my life has been thus far? It's not been marriage. Marriage has been amazing. It's not been pastoring this church, and pastoring this church has been amazing. It's not been my children, and I love my children. They're amazing. You know the greatest joy of my life has been? Hands down, it's been knowing Jesus. Hands down. And I'm telling you, the greatest joy of heaven is not going to be all the stuff. Hands down, the joy of heaven is going to be knowing Jesus forever. More and more and more and more and more every day. And as you look at that and you see that, and if for you the thing that excites you the most is the word paradise and not the words you will be with me, I just want you to know there's, you need to dig down into that because there's something wrong. There's something you're missing. And so I want to end today with a very, very simple application, very, very simple question that I'll get to in a second. And I want you to realize something, that just like the criminals, just like the criminals, just like these two thieves, everybody in this room right now and throughout the course of your life, everyone in this room is going to encounter Jesus. Some of you are maybe here for the very first time, and this is the first time you've ever encountered with the message of the cross. But right now, and for the rest of your life, you're going to be encountering this message of the cross. And just like <coughs> these criminals, you are going to respond in one of these two ways to Jesus. You're either going to respond like the guy on Jesus' left, or you're going to respond to Jesus like the guy on Jesus' right. And the Bible is very, very clear that the gospel, that this message of the cross for you will either, for those of us who are perishing, will be foolishness, but for those of us who are being saved, it will be the power of God unto salvation. So the question today is not, are you like these two criminals? That's not the question. It's not the question I want you thinking about. Am I like these two criminals? Because the Bible tells us that we're just like these two criminals. The scripture says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, and the wages of, of, of our sin is death. 
And that if we're still in our sin, we're worse than criminals. We're enemies of God. And so the question is not, are we like these criminals? The question is, which one of these criminals are you? The question is not, are we like these thieves? The question is, which thief are you? You're you're either a thief, a criminal that with your dying breath is going to reject Jesus and, and hurl abuse at Jesus, either with your mouth or with your life. Or... Like this guy over here with your dying breath, you're going to cry out to him in humility and throw yourself upon the mercy of God. The question is not, are you a thief? The question is, which thief are you? And so if this is where you are today, if this is the condition of your heart, maybe you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Maybe at least you believe he claims to be. Maybe you believe that he has benefits to offer you. But at the end of the day, with your mouth and with your life, you reject everything he stands for. That if that's where you stay until your dying breath, what Jesus will say to you is nothing. And so if that's where you are and you feel God stirring you to cry out to him in mercy today, 